Thank you guys for coming today. This is work that I'm excited to share that's been um, ongoing and is kind of a spinoff from another larger project with Valentina Duque, who's um, an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Sydney. And we wanted to link all of the uh, work we've been doing on the impact of the Great Depression on aging um, and uh, kind of uh, human capital accumulation and everything across the life course with um, these epigenetic clocks in particular. So we really wanted to see, um, you know, what was going on there and if, if these clocks could tell us something unique that other measures cannot. Um, so if you, and, and also if you have questions, just feel free to unmute yourself. So I won't monitor the chat or anything. It's just, there's too hard to keep track of everything. So if you have any questions, just please feel free to interrupt, unmute yourselves, et cetera. Okay, so let me move this down here so we can see the, the headings. Okay. Okay, so we know from a large literature in economics and, and also in gerontology and in population health that in utero and early life events can affect adult outcomes, including health, education, and wages. Um, just a really large, robust literature on this. And recently, um, you know, we've, we've had this introduction of the epigenetic clocks, which I would consider to be sens more sensitive epigenome-wide measures that are highly predictive of chronological age and mortality. Um, but it's often really challenging to study kind of the in utero effects on long-term epigenetic aging or epigenetic signatures in particular, because we lack epidemiological studies with epigenetic and socioeconomic measures across the life course. Um, so this makes it really study uh, really challenging, especially to study the causal effect of early life shocks on epigenetic modifications, despite the fact that we know that the in utero period is such an important um, kind of uh, critical stage in the life course for the development of the epigenome. Of course, there are some huge exceptions to this, including some of the Dutch hunger winter studies um, and the, the Project Ice Storm studies, um, other studies of famine and so forth. Um, as well. But overall, I would say we still really need research that can identify sensitive or critical periods when shocks have their greatest impact on long-term epigenetic aging signatures. You know, is it, is it mostly in utero? Is it, is it childhood? Do adult uh, circumstances also affect aging um, in terms of the epigenome? Uh, these are really critical questions that we don't know the answer to yet. So what we're doing here is we're gonna see whether exposure to economic fluctuations in utero impacted late life epigenetic aging. And we're gonna focus here on the most severe and prolonged economic downturn in American history, which is the Great Depression. So you can see here, uh, this is kind of just real GDP per working age person in the US between 1875 and 2010. And you can see what a standout uh, the Great Depression period was in terms of both the depth of the recession and the length of the recession. Um, you can kind of see the 2007 recession here, 2008 recession, um, but it's really small in comparison. Sometimes it doesn't go, oh, I guess I just click, okay. So maybe it's kind of obvious, but just to kind of, you know, drive this po point home a little bit more, why focus on the Great Depression? I mean, first of all, it was this massive economic shock so a quarter of the US labor force was unemployed, fortunes were destroyed, and there was no social safety net at the time. So there were no food stamps, uh, there was no unemployment insurance, um, you know, and it was four to five times the size of the Great Recession of 2007. Um, in terms of women and, and families at the time too, there were no prenatal vitamins. Um, there was not you know, regular prenatal care or health insurance. Um, so if you were pregnant at the time too, you can imagine that, you know, declines in nutrition were going to happen, other things, um, increases in perhaps infection rates, um, sanitation conditions weren't were what they are today. Um, so all of these things played, uh, you know, a bigger role than we might experience um, in current economic recessions, which are also very, you know, trying for society. Um, so it was this huge and also unexpected financial shock. Um, what some people don't know is that there was also really dramatic geographic and temporal variation in economic uh, variation in economic conditions in the 1930s 
due to the Great Depression and the subsequent government relief programs from the New Deal. So those varied a lot by state. And so what we're going to do in this study is exploit state and year-level variation in macroeconomic conditions during the 1930s to identify the impact of the Great Depression on epigenetic aging. Um, and we're going to use the health and retirement study. And what's excited about the HRS is that it is the first nationally represents, representative study in the U.S. to collect epigenetic data. Um, and it is a very large, uh, you know, sample for epigenetic data collection. And it has the geographic variation necessary to assess state uh, year level differences um, in economic conditions at birth. So that's that's a first. So what we do in the study, um, and, and, and what I'm going to do in the presentation today, is first I'm going to provide evidence on the relationship between economic conditions in utero and individuals' biological age in later life, as measured by epigenetic clocks. We're going to examine some potential mechanisms. And then we're going to evaluate the extent to which this relationship is driven by selective behaviors versus an actual causal effect of the economic shock. Um, so let's start with the first one. Um, the sources of data that we use are all the sources of data that we know um, on state year variation in economic conditions in the 1930s. Um, the Great Depression launched the field of macroeconomics, so there isn't a lot of data on unemployment and wages and so forth before uh, the Great Depression. Did somebody want to? Um, so uh, that's why there's just not a lot of state level data um, that we can we can exploit. Um, so we're going to use in, in particular what I'm going to show you today are just results from the first um, which is uh, we're going to use a wage index and why we're going to use this, it's, which basically just includes farm and non-farm wages for each state from the BEA. Why we like this in particular is it captions both the urban and rural sectors of the economy. And importantly, um, the data go not just up to 1940, but through the 60s. And so we can actually then do a more detailed event time study analysis. Um, but we also do robustness checks with the other, the other two measures. Um, so just to show you the, the variation across states and over time in the 1940s, um, here we're indexing the year 1929 to 100. So you can see um, you know, the huge fall in wages that happened right around the, the nadir of the Great Depression, and then how they slowly uh, rose back up during the New Deal era. Um, but you know, obviously a lot of variation across states here. Same is true of the employment index. So this is just showing um, the data source here is Wallace uh, from 1989. Or is DC not an outlier in this one? Um, yeah, I think DC is still in this one. Um, it might not be. Sometimes just DC wasn't measured or as often as some of the other states. Um, it could, I think it is in there. I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I'm pretty sure DC is in here too. Um, but for whatever reason, wages, you know, were different than, un than unemployment. So these are two different, you know, measures of um, economic health. The outcome here that we're going to look at is the epigenetic clocks. Um, so the epigenetic clock is a composite score of CPG sites that are highly associated with chronological age or phenotypes of aging. They're typically uh, built by regressing chronological age or phenotypic age on CPG sites. Um, using a supervised machine learning method um, that also includes weighted. Um, so basically, it's just the weighted linear average of methylation levels um, across different CPG sites. Um, and then what, what uh, people do then is they look at deviations between DNA methylation age and chronological age, um, which you can call epigenetic age acceleration, um, to see kind of whether people are aging faster or slower than their chronological age. And so that's really the key point here. So it's a really been a groundbreaking way to measure biological age um, that hasn't um, that is proving a lot more consistent and uh, predictive of mortality than other measures of biological age that have come before it in the gerontology literature. Um, there's only so there's been, you know, a lot of clocks created so far. I think we're maybe it's past 13 now. I don't know what, where we're at in terms of the number of clocks that have been created. Um, but interestingly enough, only a handful of CPG sites overlap across clocks and the clocks are not super highly correlated. Um, so, you know, here really, it, and this is just important kind of in, in what we'll see in the results. 
this, this top band, I would call these first generation clocks, and they were trained on chronological age. And then as the, the field kind of progressed, there's these second generation clocks now that uh, train the CPG sites on um, actual biological measures of aging. Um, and so uh, at least what we found in a recent study is that these biological uh, kind of, that the second generation clocks, I should say, um, tend to kind of detect uh, social associations, especially with SES, um, a, a little bit better. And they're also more, those associations are more replicable across studies um, when we didn't find that with the, the first generation clocks. And I mean, intuitively, that makes sense. If you're going to train a clock on chronological age, you're going to get something that's a really good predictor of chronological age. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good predictor of biological age. So, you know, that's, yeah. And um, there's also been some recent work looking at how these clocks are overlapping, where they overlap. Um, I think they are capturing similar aging pathways, but uh, some of them are built to capture, you know, multi-tissue across tissue predictors. Um, one is kind of specifically a cancer clock. Um, so it just, there's a, there's a lot of variation. The, the Dunedin poem clock is actually measuring rate of aging uh, rather than um, differences in the level of aging across individuals. So that's also a difference. So if you are able to directly measure these biological markers for aging, mm -hmm. would you still use the epigenetic clock? Say that again? If you are able to measure the outcomes you predict in the second generation clocks, would you still prefer to use epigenetics to predict that in your data? Um, yes, because oftentimes the measures that they use are difficult to find in a lot of epidemiological studies. Right, but that, I'm just assuming that if you are able to measure that, is there a reason to still use epigenetics? Because that is the case for age itself, right? For first generation clocks, you have age in this cohort, but you think epigenetics somehow give you extra information. I wonder if that's the case for second generation. Clocks. Right, for second generation. You know, I haven't seen, I saw, I've seen a few studies that have compared um, in studies that, you know, didn't work. So these clocks were trained on specific studies. So I have seen some uh, work that has compared these different biological measures of age, like epigenetic age, and then also some of these other indicators that these clocks use in terms of phenotypic outcomes to train outside of sample. Um, and the epigenetics just always performs better. And when I say better, it means more predictive of mortality. Um, so then the outcomes, then the, then the other outcomes. I think the other difficulty is um, these are often trained to, you know, actually then align with age, whereas a lot of other clocks um, or other phenotypic measures aren't necessarily, um, you, you, you can't like, uh, they're just, you have to kind of like sum them together and create some sort of measure that's a, that's a composite measure across all these different kind of um, phenotypic measures and then align it with age. So it's also just more work. Um, and the epigenetics just seems to capture more broadly um, aging across these different systems. So it's also just more efficient, I would say. Yeah, and Lauren, this is Kristen. I would also add that, um, you know, in this context, the ability to sort of train these metrics around some normalization within the population of acceleration beyond what you would expect is really the outcome that you're looking at. So you're not really looking at these phenotypes as saying that given the, the population as a whole, based on these predicted clocks, how many people based on their methylation patterns show an accelerated an accelerated epigenetic signature versus more like where you would expect. So the outcome you're really looking at is deviation from what the expectation would be given these epigenetic signatures. So it's different than the phenotype, even though the clocks are trained on these phenotypes, it, um, the clocks themselves um, allow you to look at acceleration from what you would expect. Does that, does that make sense? So it's, it's a different metric than the phenotypes themselves. So they're trained on the phenotypes and you should look at the phenotypes, but if you're really trying to understand what are the things that lead to accelerated biological aging in this construct of numbers of CPGs, that's a, that's a different outcome altogether than the actual phenotype. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So you're seeing a particularly high level of the outcome based on one of the second generation clocks wouldn't tell you deviation from the expected age. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, cause you could, you could technically still train, use these other phenotypic measures and train them the same way so that they're, uh, you know, they correlate with age and then you could still, you know, subtract out age to see 
you know, projected differences from chronological age. I think you could still do that with these other phenotypic markers. I think that's what you're saying, right? Is that, so, that well, that's how, that's how we use that? it. Yeah, yeah. What, what will be an example of the outcome in a, in a second generation class? Um, so things like um, albumin, um, uh, so, uh, so ta- uh, what is it? Um, like all these kind of biomarkers of age, a uh, statin C. Um, is that like a metabolite or a protein or? No, no, nothing like that. So it's it's never like, meta, uh, there's never any kind of like proteome data or metabolic data or met- metabolite data, I should say. Um, so it's usually just recognized signs of aging, like sometimes like grip strength even, or, um, you know, the grim age has smoking in it. So there, there's lots okay. of different um, measures um, usually, though, they are these more, um, you know, things that you would get from blood, you know, so different biomarkers from blood that are correlated with poor health. And yeah, I, I think I understand it if the outcome is things like group stress, right? Mm-hmm. But if it's an actual biomarker in the blood, I would think that that itself, having a particularly high level of that biomarker should tell you something about aging itself, right? And but it does, and it does, and it does. But I, in that case, why would you still use epigenetics too? I think the goal, and and yeah, jump in, Kristen, if, if I'm like still not saying this right, is to take all these different dimensions of biological age that we have and then map them onto one dimension, which is epigenetics, mm-hmm. and then to train that to be um, in units of chronological age so that it's very easy to just take this one measure and look at deviations. And I think also the epigenome in, in, in general um, is very sensitive to differences in age. So it, it's kind of like all these other biomarkers that we had before we had epigenetics, I don't think do as good of a job and are more complicated to collect and assay than just using epigenetics. And, and honestly, what I see it as is so, you know, you have DNA and then there's a whole set of biological processes that go from changes in DNA methylation patterns to gene transcription to actual phenotypes. And so knowing that phenotypes predict outcomes, the epigenetic markers, you can have, the, so I, the, mo, the clock that I'm most familiar with different than the Horvath clocks or some of the first generation clocks is the phenotypic age clock, right? So if you train that clock on what are all of the CPG methylation patterns that are predictive of these biomarkers that are then predicted of, of accelerated aging, right? Can you see um, within that 513, that pattern of 513 CPGs, you may or may not have the actual phenotypic outcome of high cholesterol, right? But you may have the DNA mat- methylation patterns that put you at greater risk for that high cholesterol, which then, so to me, it's almost like earlier biomarkers of risk in and of themselves, that if you have high cholesterol, you'll have this epigenetic profile. And can we see that epigenetic profile in people, whether or not they have high cholesterol, which gets you a little bit earlier on the pathway towards the actual phenotypic outcome. And so if you're accelerated on that phenotypic age clock, that means you're heading down an an accelerated aging pathway. And so it's just one metric of accelerated aging. But I think one of the challenges is that every time they train these clocks, you have, it really depends on what your training data set is and the the number of biomarkers that you train on that creates that CPG profile. So, you know, if there's very little overlap, there's maybe from that original Horvath clock to the phenotypic age clock, there's 41 CPG sites that overlap. So, um, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses in having these metrics, but they, they do start to show patterns that are sort of interesting and informative. Is that helpful? Yeah. And yeah, and Kristen brought up a good point about, I think what's attractive about the field of epigenetics in general is that there's room for intervention because you can see things before they actually manifest to um, a phenotype mm-hmm. because it's Lauren. Genetic. Yeah. Oh, Lauren, else oh, this is Ava. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. I just want to, uh, just for my own background information, you had mentioned uh, one of the differences between the first generation and the second generation clocks is that the second generation tend to uh, be more aligned with um, social determinants of health. And I'm wondering when uh, you're thinking about which uh, clock to use, what what do you think about as the gold standard for um, what is a good clock? And maybe, um, I guess I was really 
interested in your comment that the second generation clocks really tracked with social outcomes. And is that a good or bad thing? Not like, I guess I, I shouldn't really use good or bad, but is that really what we want? Or do we want to um, uh, find out more about the biological process independent of um, some of these social factors? I, I don't know. Maybe you can talk about that a little more just to clarify um, what is a gold standard for selecting what's a good clock? Um, thanks Ava for that question. I think that's a good one. I think right now there are no gold standards. I think what I've seen broadly in the literature, what's starting to happen more is that people are showing results for all the clocks because I think in large part, everyone is still kind of trying to figure out how these clocks are different. Um, and, and there is kind of in that sense, no best clock. Also, some of these clocks are capturing slightly different biological processes. Um, some are more aligned together than others. So, um, you know, for now, I think looking across all clocks is, is a good way to go. Um, I think as far as social determinants of health, I think, you know, my hypothesis about why these second generation clocks are performing better is because they were trained on phenotypic measures of age. So they're actually um, more sensitive in, in picking up some of these biological differences which um, is helpful for social determinants of health. Um, so they're actually more somehow closer, you know, proximal to, to, bio, to biological age. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the sources of microdata, we're gonna use the HRS as I uh, mentioned, um, you know, which has a lot of, I, I won't go into HRS, we all know the HRS. In 2016, epigenetic data was assayed on a random subsample. And so we're gonna use the publicly available clocks that were constructed by the health and retirement study. They still haven't made their CPG level data available. So even if we wanted to use to do them ourselves or look at specific CPG sites, um, we can't do that at this time. Um, we're also gonna use the decennial population census um, and vital statistics death records um, for a lot of our um, you know, sensitivity and selectivity checks. And so we're going to link state level economic data to these micro data sources using data on year of birth and restricted data on state of birth. Our total sample ends up including 832 individuals who were born between 1932 and 1940 who had their blood drawn in 2016. Um, so yes, this is an older sample. The average age is around 78. Um, and ranges between 75 and 84. Um, we will be talking about mortality selection. That's like the big elephant in the room. Um, so no worries about that. Um, and that was just a limitation that we had because their blood was collected in 2016. 56% um, were female, um, pretty decent um, you know, socioeconomic uh, and uh, racial distribution there. Um, and that was intentional. The HRS really wanted this to be broadly representative of the HRS sample in general. So they didn't want it to be, um, you know, skewed one way or the other. Um, and you can see individuals already starting to age here. 29% have diabetes. 71% uh, suffered from high blood pressure. 16% reported having at least one ADL. Um, and the reason 1932 to 1940 is we do need a couple years of pre-trend data. Um, so uh, we needed to have we couldn't use um, people starting in 1929 before the depression hit because we didn't have data prior to 1929. Let's ask a quick question. So there, so different epigenetic clocks use different tissues, but HRS collects the, uh, the data from just a product, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to use the data from the broad to create, uh, to use the epigenetic age which constructed by non-broad tissues? Yes, absolutely. So uh, yeah, some of the clocks are multi-tissue clocks. They were trained across different tissue types. But by doing that, like, so for example, the Horvath clock, by training it across all these different tissue types, he was hoping to pick up on replicable signatures, epigenetic signatures across tissue types. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, they all perform well in blood. This is our basic differences and difference, uh, difference and differences specification here. Um, so our outcome is epigenetic age acceleration uh, for individual I who was born in state S in region R um, and uh, in year C, which was 2016. Um, wages here, so that's our, our exposure variable. Our, it's the aggregate wage index at the state and year level for the period before conception. So we have a pre-trend in there, um, the period in utero, and then the period in early childhood. 
Um, we then also, uh, you know, control for sex, race, uh, and maternal education. And then we have um, a lot of uh, important state level controls and fixed effects um, to, to really help identify this model. So uh, we also include the vector of state level characteristics around 1930. So things like maternal and infant mortality rates, um, uh, the state population interacted with your birth time trends, um, the state share of wage earners in manufacturing in 1930 um, interacted with your birth fixed effects. Um, of course, just have the basic difference in difference skeleton components here, which would be state and year birth fixed effects. Um, and then we also have a region of birth times year birth time trends. Um, and then the standard errors are clustered at the state of birth uh, here. I'm sorry, it's not the individual level, just the state of birth level, because we just have one. We're not using the full HRS panel, just using the, the 2016. I um, mean, we do estimate the, the results using uh, the VBS sample weights. So this is the venous blood sample, uh, which is that 2016 uh, sample that was taken in the HRS of, of individual's blood. All right, so first I'm gonna show you results for the baseline uh, model. So what we're doing here, I'm trying to move this, um, is just, uh, what we're doing here is um, just showing the baseline model for state level wages in utero on epigenetic age acceleration. Um, so this is just, I, I don't have any event time study variables in here. We're just looking at the uh, in utero index. Um, and so here, you know, higher wages at the, in, uh, when you were in utero or around the time of your birth, um, you can see for most clocks, it's negative, meaning lower epigenetic age. So you were aging biologically slower. Um, and we can see for the more, uh, two of the more recent clocks, Grim Age and Dunedin Poem, um, we have quite significant uh, findings. And these are not trivial in terms of the magnitude of these effects. So here, a one standard deviation increase in the wage index in utero led to a 0.31, 0.37 standard deviation decline in uh, Grim Age uh, epigenetic age acceleration POAM epigenetic age acceleration. Um, and that tracks, this, this, this magnitude tracks a lot with some of the other um, studies that have been done in economics on in utero effects on long-term health. Um, so like a famous paper on, on food stamps, for example, the effect of food stamps in utero and in early childhood. Um, and uh, the one, uh, one standard deviation of the wage index, just so you know, when I talk about standard deviations, what does that mean, um, is equivalent about to 80% of the overall decline that happened in wages during the, the Great Depression. So um, yeah, these, these, uh, these effects are not trivial, we see, okay. And then what we see as, so now I'm just focusing on one clock where we found significant findings. Um, just as an example, I could show you POAM, it looks very similar, but I just wanna show you here in this slide what happens as we add more covariates to the model. Um, and you can see that the, the coefficient is remarkably stable. Um, so we can throw kind of anything we want at the model as it gets progressively more robust and we don't see um, much, the, the coefficient doesn't wobble much. So that's that was, we were actually quite surprised at how stable these findings were um, because prior to these clocks coming out, we had been doing all of this with the phenotype data in the HRS. And it was in a much, much larger sample, you know, and uh, we were not seeing such consistent findings. Why do you see improved effect size when you add covariates? Why do I think it improved the effect size when the fifth model has the largest effect size. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so I think there were a lot of, I think it's just helping to more closely isolate the effect because you have to imagine this was an incredibly complex time. There was a lot going on. Um, and so I think adding in other state level controls that are accounting for other um, population health metrics, things like that, um, share of manufacturing it was very important. Um, because a lot of the fluctuations that you see in state level wages and unemployment are linked to manufacturing versus non-manufacturing differences in terms of, um, you know, just the regional differences in, in employment. Um, so I think adding these different um, time trends and, and year birth and fixed effects and so forth um, just help to better identify the model. So this is really, to me, the core takeaway. And this is, uh, so here you're looking at an event time study. So here what we did was we don't just have the coefficient for in utero exposures. We have a pretrend, and then we have 
a person's exposure. So we have all these coefficients in the same model. We have their exposure uh, to wages at the state level uh, when they were one to two, three to four, et cetera, all the way up to ages 15 and 16. So this is an incredibly stringent model. Um, and you can see that the one effect that really, the only effect that survives is this in utero effect. So that, you know, we're, we're kind of really saying we're gonna throw in your entire childhood is it still the in utero effect or was it something that was correlated with the in utero effect downstream? Um, and, and we just don't see evidence of that. It seems to um, really map onto in utero, right around that in utero year of birth time. Um, so this was quite striking. And uh, we see the same, um, we see the same patterns with Dunedin Poem. So with that other clock that was significant, um, when we add in the entire event time study specification, um, we still see kind of the standout for the in utero period. And this model has all the controls. So this is the fully specified model. So a big question is, okay, well, you're looking at this highly selected sample. These are people who were born in the 1930s and they survived to be you know, anywhere from 75 to 85 um, to get their blood drawn. And so, yes, um, what we do see, and, and this is in the health and retirement study here, we're looking at the probability of survival at age 65, 75, and 85. And we do see that uh, individuals, you know, the higher uh, the wage index, so the better the economic conditions in your state of birth in the 1930s, the more likely you were to survive until ages 75 and 85. Um, so this is a positively selected sample. Um, it, it appears. Um, if anything, we think that's that's biasing our coefficients downward. So in other words, it seems like healthier or less healthy people died before they were able to have their blood taken. So if anything, this is biasing our coefficients downward. Um, so we might see stronger effects had we measured individuals' blood earlier or a larger sample, you know, earlier in the health and retirement study. So here, just, you know, to give you an idea of the magnitude a one standard deviation increase in the wage index in utero led to a three to five percent increase in the probability of survival past age 75. Um, so yeah. And I should probably say too that this um, effect is probably a little watered down because this is really an intent to treat. Um, we don't actually have you know the the um, the real treatment effect here because we don't know exactly who received the treatment and who didn't. Um, so this is kind of the a more watered down version, I would say, of, of the actual treatment effect. What, what uh, I don't understand that last point. What's the treatment versus, so the intent to treat versus the treatment on the treated, what, what do you mean by that? So I just, uh, well, like in the sense of if we actually knew in the HRS um, what individuals, you know, the extent to which they were actually treated, the extent to which they were actually, you know, we're kind of using this global measure of state of birth. But if we actually had an RCT where we knew or something like that, that this person was actually treated more strongly than this person Do you because mean of their like their household had income loss or something. Yeah, yeah. Like if they were actually more severe, um, if we could kind of or or maybe have a more precise measure at the county level or something like that. So um, have you linked these state level measures to the self retrospective self reports of whether they grew up poor and stuff? So, well, yes. So, cause yeah, cause we have mother's education in there and stuff, mother's but you mean, are you trying to say like if the salaries predicts so the, or the wage index things. predicts? I guess, I guess there's a couple of things. One is the HRS sample reports whether they grew up poor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it seems like you would, maybe not, I guess, I guess that'd be a, a still a little, distal from what you want. You want their household income like in that during the in utero period. Yeah, like whether you know they actually experienced a long like, out of unemployment or or something like that. Um, of course this is yeah obviously more exogenous, but it's just more um, it's more I would say like a more watered down like version of the actual treatment effect. And then and then the way these coefficients are if you had if you had good news as in utero so like a, this index is higher means good wages. Yes. So if you had good news, if you were like on the upswing of your plot, you're more likely to survive mm -hmm. to be in the data set 
in your in your blood sample mm -hmm. that push this question about which way the coefficients go you're, you're saying that the does that not allow weaker people to be in your sample? Because that, like, uh, otherwise they would have died if they didn't get that push in your own. So, what, so do we, so, have I got that wrong? Well, so basically if um, people were, uh, you know, people who experienced the worst conditions say, or if you experienced worse conditions, um, then you died earlier. So these are, People who, yes, either were weaker, maybe, but were able to live longer because they had better conditions, or people who just had better conditions so they were able to live longer. And in any, in either case, I think we would see better health for the people who had higher wages. And so this sample is in better health than individuals who died earlier. Um, and so we don't have those individuals with poorer health in our sample. So this coefficient in terms of like, the, you know, how strong the effect is, we would expect to see it, it not be as strong as if we had all those people in there who died earlier because they were in poor health. Chris, are you back, Kristen? Yeah, hi, Chris. <laughs> Do you have a question, Kristen? Oh, I was just thinking it's very analogous. To, this makes a lot of sense to me because it's super analogous to what we think about all the time in epidemiology is the healthy worker effect in that individuals who are working by nature are actually people who are healthier. So you're going to see like risk to outcome associations. You're, you're missing the most vulnerable. So the most vulnerable have already died off by the time they did the measurements in the HRS. So when you're looking at the mechanism of these early economic effects, you're, you're looking at an already potentially healthier population because they've lived longer just because they've lived longer. And so if we're looking at accelerated biological aging amongst those who are healthy, you still see, you know, accelerated aging amongst those cohorts. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I feel like Lauren's trying to get at here. Just mm -hmm. does it is that different mm -hmm. than how you're seeing it, um, Jason? I, it's not different. I, I it's usually in these cases where I get caught, I get caught up in the selection versus scarring, which is different words than you're using, Kristen, but the same thing, which is that some people with getting this negative shock. Uh, don't survive early or late, um, not in the HRS either, right? And then the, some of the survivors could have been scarred. But I, I think what's catching actually uh, a little bit confusing to me is that you have, because you have a dip and a recovery, you've got two types of treatments here in some mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're being used in that way. That's what I was being confused about, whether we should consider the up pick good news or mm -hmm. the lack or everyone's worse off than without the great depression. And it's just di different versions of bad news. That's what I'm a little bit, uh, which isn't settled in my mind. Like if you're using, I think, so there's, there's one question of, I think because of the birth cohorts, you're using mostly the upswing, mm -hmm. not as much the downswing, but that, but I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then it, are we using, is there any asymmetry? asymmetry that we should keep in mind as far as like drastic shocks to life that are terrible and then the recovery part being good news or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's not that's not uh, related exactly on your point. I think it's the combination of the selection and scarring with having two types of treatments here, like an unanticipated bad news and then a Mm -hmm. anticipated good news in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that's, I think that like that whole, what about the new deal is, yeah. is a really important question. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit later because we show some evidence that this isn't being driven by the upswing. It's not being driven by the new deal. Um, so this, this basic kind of diff and diff of you were born in 1934. So you were a little bit better off than someone who was born in 1933. And if you were born in 1937, you were a lot better off. Yeah. But even there, there was a lot of variation across states. So some states got a lot more New Deal spending than others, et cetera. So there was still um, a lot of variation in good, bad across. It wasn't all good. It was getting better. It was an right. upswing, but it wasn't still all good. Yeah, yeah. But you're using, this is where when you're using, not in this figure, but in previous figures, you had like linear time trends, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. You know, uh, the picture wasn't linear. It was like like that. Mm -hmm. So the like so similar question is like, what are those linear trends imposing if, 
is essentially restating this question about asymmetry, about the shocking declines with the, you know, with variation, but the recovery period um, being treated as the same, in some sense, the same thing. They're not being treated differently, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think so for the linear trends, like we also imposed non-linear trends and, and got similar results. Um, I think the, like, so if we just use region of birth times your birth fixed effects rather than time trends. Um, but that's just, yeah, very, very robust model. So it was, especially with 832 people, it was definitely taking away more variation than, than mm -hmm. I think we needed to. But um, yeah, the time trends I think are just controlling for other different trends across states that were not necessarily, or, you know, that are may or may not have been correlated with this, that we wanted to make sure we were actually really capturing the effects of wages across states or the effects of employment across states. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure how I would go about constructing the exposure in a way that would somehow capture that other than just that, yeah, depending on when you were born, you either had this level or you had this level. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, it was uh, such a rich time period. It, it took us a long time <laughs> to like really fully make sure that we were accounting for all the trends and everything that was going on in this time period. Which is also, I think, why there's been so much in terms of the micro data on the, or, you know, the micro literature on the Great Depression, which is practically non-existent. There's like very few studies, mm -hmm. um, given what an incredible shock it was. Um, it, there just have been such divergent findings. Okay, so just to show you a little bit more on mortality, we were also interested. Well, if you if you did die before you reached the sample. What did you die of? Now, we, our power here is very challenged, but what we found fascinating was that people were more likely to die, uh, people who had um, higher wages in utero, or you can flip it if they had lower wages in utero, um, say you had lower wages in utero, you were more likely to die of a metabolic condition. Um, so we know metabolic syndrome is linked more to in utero nutrition deficits. And I'll talk about that in just a second when we get to the mechanisms. Um, because we'll see in the mechanism data, so keep this in mind, because we'll see when we start to look at the mechanism data that we actually don't find much evidence of metabolic syndrome in the sample that survived to 75. And I think it's because a lot of the people with the worst kind of metabolic conditions may have already died. So that's something to kind of keep in mind with this. Um, but interestingly enough, I think that with heart conditions in this sample. Are these HRS samples who reported these disease outcomes but didn't survive long enough to get the blood drawn? Or? Correct. So this is everyone who was born between uh, 1929 and 1940, um, so who, uh, you know, was in the HRS. So everybody who ended up being in the HRS um, who then, you know, was not able to get their blood drawn, but who was a, a, like a fellow member of that same cohort. And, you know, you might say, oh, well, the HRS is already a really selected sample if you live to be 50, you know, so what if we go back even further? Um, so then we actually turned to the vital statistics death records, um, and there were a few years in, in 1990, or I'm sorry, 1980, 1990, and 2000, where they did have your birth information, so we could link um, your, your death to, I'm sorry, your state of birth, we could link your death to your state of birth, and so we looked at the same experiment, um, and, we, and we see, you know, higher wage index, uh, less likely to die. This is the, the log uh, age-adjusted mortality rate. So this is, um, and then this mean here is just the mean deaths per 100,000. So um, if we look here, this is translating into like a 5.4% decline in mortality if you had a higher wage index in the state that you were born. So this is in the, in the death records for that same, those same birth cohorts. So prior to them even entering the HRS. Here again, too, we're looking at cause of death um, in, in the death records. And again, we see, um, you know, the, the diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular. Uh, so those deaths that would be indicative of um, more kind of fetal origins um, in utero insults. Um, and accidents <laughs> we see um, are kind of like a placebo or uh, so we don't see anything with accidents, which was, you know, interesting or with infectious disease. So 
not the intuitive, but you do have a significant finding for mm -hmm. accidents. But yeah, it's going in the wrong direction and um, it's definitely not in utero. So that could be picking up on other things post needle. Um, so in terms of other robustness checks that we did, I'm just gonna go through the list here. I'm not gonna show you all the data. Um, so we also looked at uh, you know, these two other measures of economic conditions at the time, employment and car sales. And we did find that our results were robust to those other measures. So this wasn't just some unique artifact of the wage index. Um, we also just looked in the European ancestry subsample, which was 632 people, um, and also then included the genetic principal components in there to see, is this like a population stratification thing? Because we know there is heritability here with the clocks, they are also influenced um, by uh, genetic forces. So this all, you know, just wanted to double check that. Um, nothing, if anything, our results are stronger in the European ancestry uh, sample, which I think would kind of, um, you know, track with a lot of other literature on minority samples that survive to be in the oldest old groups and how they are kind of different than a lot of um, kind of the broad population sample. They tend to be healthy, much, much healthier. Um, we also looked at cell type because that's important. This was, uh, the epigenetics was profiled in whole blood. So we wanted to make sure that our results weren't being driven entirely by cell type. Um, so we looked at, uh, you know, we put in our control for the different proportion, white blood cell uh, type proportions and, and was not being driven by cell type. Um, and then, you know, there were a lot of, like I said, other really co-occurring shocks that were going on at the time. A big one, a big one was the Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl happened alongside the Great Depression and it, it was just this really particularly bad time for agriculture um, just because of um, a lot of agricultural practices and things at the time and drought had just caused this massive kickup of dust storms. And so the crops in those years were just terrible. And so that really on top of everything else <laughs> made this whole, you know, Great Depression era really bad because they're just, the crops weren't as good. People weren't getting as much food. So one could say, well, are you just capturing the Dust Bowl? Like, is this really the Dust Bowl or was this really the effect of, of wages and unemployment? Um, so we looked at people um, in Dust Bowl and non-Dust Bowl states who were born in Dust Bowl and non-Dust Bowl states. And we find that the effect is similar in non-Dust Bowl states. And if anything, the effect is stronger in Dust Bowl states. Um, so this again, suggests that there might've been a compounding effect of the Dust Bowl on top of the Great Depression um, perhaps due to effects of nutri nutritional deprivation, you know, in addition to the income shock. Um, we also assessed the impact of New Deal spending um, using relief spending data from, from Fishback. Um, and so we found that higher spending is not significantly associated with epigenetic age acceleration and its inclusion does not affect model results. So if we account for, you know, how each state got a different amount of New Deal spending from the government, depending on how bad off that state was. And so you can imagine states that were worse off a lot of times got more New Deal spending than other states. Um, so that could definitely kind of bias our results if this is all being driven by the New Deal. Um, but we didn't find an effect of that on our, our results. And finally, the other big thing that happened in the early, you know, late kind of 30s into the early 1940s is World War II. Um, so we also examined whether our estimates were being driven by World War II using state level data on mobilization rates from Asimoglu. Um, and we interacted that with the wage index and also, again, not su substantively affect results. And here mobilization rates are, you know, there were states that had more men that went to the war than other states. Um, and so we looked at whether you know, higher probability of being kind of drafted into the war, mobilizing into the war, if that, that affected things. Okay, Anna Marie. I just yeah. have a quick question on the robustness checks part. Um, so you guys say that you control, or like the states are identified based on where the individuals are born. Um, and I don't know how much data we have on migration at this time or anything like that, but do you think like, perhaps that could impact the results as well. Like born in Illinois, you move to opportunity somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, that's a super good question, Anna Maria, thank you. Um, yeah, that's not something I put on the other side, but we did also look at migration. The best we could do, so we know where people were born in the HRS, and then we know where they lived when they were about age 10 or during their primary schooling years. So we looked at people uh, who moved states, so those who were born um, in one state were in a different state by the time they were age 10, 
And we compared the results from our specification with those individuals to people who did not move. And we didn't see any differences in our results. Okay. Um, the other like thing that. I had too was regarding the spending numbers that you have. Are those like adjusted at all for the potential endogeneity of the spending? Like perhaps during the New Deal, you look at the location, you're like, oh, this place has a ton of construction employment, which got hit really hard. So we're going to spend more in this location. Um, well, I, I think that's, I think that's kind of the, what the problem that we're worried about is that in a sense, you know, maybe what we're picking up is off the fact that some states got more New Deal spending because you were born in a state that had more manufacturing and you were hit harder. Um, and so maybe what you're picking up is this is higher, you know, spending in that state, which was endogenous. Um, so we, what we did there was we just looked at those, we included the, um, that, that state spending in the model and also interacted it with the wage index and so forth. And oh, okay, that's good. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. You're thinking exactly about the, the things that we were worried about, about all the right things. Yeah, great questions. So now, you know, you might say, okay, this is great. And, but who cares? We already know that there's, we already know that the in utero period matters. We've known that for decades. Um, and is this just another in utero paper? And, and what do we learn here? So we wanted to examine some potential mechanisms. We wanted to see what might be going on with the sample, um, what kind of affected some higher epigenetic aging rates. So, you know, based on the fact that we saw that the results were strongest during the in utero kind of right around the year of birth period, we really thought we should look at fetal origins of mental and physical health. Um, so this is this you know, large literature that started with Barker and, and there's so many others that have contributed to this rich literature where you're really looking at influences of maternal environment during these critical phases of development um, on outcomes of aging and mental health. And there's two main pathways I think that have been identified in the literature. Um, one is that you know, excess maternal stress or cortisol. So if a, a, a you know, pregnant woman is excessively stressed out and so forth during her pregnancy, she's going to excrete more cortisol. Cortisol actually passes through the placental wall and it can affect how the fetus's brain is, in, is developing. And what it's been shown to do is actually increase um, the likelihood of HPA axis type disturbances um, in, the, in the child, including depression and anxiety. Um, the other major uh, channel that people have looked at is nutrition. This is kind of more the Barker hypothesis. Um, so inadequate maternal nutrition, uh, which has been shown to be linked with metabolic syndrome, which is kind of this, this kind of confluence of different uh, factors, including diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease. Um, so, you know, that individuals, basically what happens is if you're not getting enough nutrition while you're growing in utero, the body, the epigenome is going to, you know, kind of compensate for that by expressing certain genes rather than others that make it more likely for you to survive when you're outside of the, the womb. So what happens then is that you're more likely to be uh, put on weight more easily. You have, you know, higher uh, waist to hip ratio. Uh, you know, you're just more likely to, to develop more of these metabolic conditions um, because you didn't receive inadequate maternal nutrition, adequate maternal nutrition. So um, that's kind of the two main we wanted two main pathways we want to look at. There's also another one that Eileen Crimmins and um, uh, um, Colin Finch, um, who are both you know famous gerontologists, have really uh, studied in depth that I'd like to incorporate somehow, and I'm still trying to think about how to best to do it, which is the pathway of infection. Um, and they stress that you know uh, exposure to infection, maternal exposure to infection, can also have uh, a lot of long-term effects. So the first one we look at is mental health. Um, so again, this is this HPA axis um, disturbances. And so we look at, again, we have kind of our pre-trend and then we have the wage index in utero and this is the full model. So we have all our controls in there. And we looked at a number of different um, you know, measures of depression and anxiety that are in the HRS. So the first is um, CESD, which is the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Score. So this is just capturing kind of um, you know, indicators of depression in the, in the past couple of weeks. Of course, it's not a perfect measure because it's not, you know, it's measured in the past couple of weeks. But um, we, we took this as close as we could to when individual's blood was drawn. And here we just looked at whether an individual had two or more cestes 
more SESTIs or worse. Um, we chose two because that seemed to be the relevant margin. There were about 50% of people in this sample who didn't have any SESTI. So just to kind of make it a little bit easier to capture. Um, and we do find some evidence that, you know, if your wage index was higher in utero, you're less likely to report depressive symptoms at older ages. Um, and then we really found some strong effects for anxiety and neuroticism, which that is like very indicative of an HPA axis disturbance, higher stress levels in utero. So we find um, they have a much higher uh, Beck anxiety index, um, which is kind of a well, um, you know, uh, well validated anxiety index in, in population studies. Um, they're also, uh, you know, less like or more likely, you know, if your wage index was was lower, you're more likely uh, to show symptoms of I don't know symptoms, but qualities of, of a neurotic personality. You know, if you look at the big five personalities. Um, you're also more likely to be on anxiety or depression medication. And then we wanted to look at kind of things that are associated with these, these mental health issues, which I would say would be smoking and drinking. Um, so the health behavior index incorporates both smoking and drinking. And you can see that's a little bit stronger than the, each of the measures on their own. Um, but you can see uh, there are individuals were also more likely to, to smoke and drink. Um, why do you only use 800 samples for analysis like this? Uh, because that was all that we had. That, those, that's our total sample size. You don't actually require epigenetics in this, right? No, but we just wanted to look in the sample that we estimated. You're right that we could look at the whole sample that survived in 2016, but we just wanted to look in our primary estimation sample. Um, okay. Yeah. So in, in the sample that we actually find our findings in, you know, what were some of the mechanisms potentially for that sample in terms of accelerated epigenetic aging? So it seems like mental health may, may you know, for people who survived to age 75 may be, you know, a factor. And, and the resulting kind of behaviors that, that go along with that. Um, oops. So then we looked at this second nutritional pathway, which would be metabolic syndrome. Um, we were shocked to not find anything with the metabolic index, which is kind of, these are the individual indicators that are in the, the metabolic syndrome, well, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Um, but again, you know, after looking at causes of death in the HRS, it could be that a lot of individuals who had um, kind of indicators of metabolic syndrome who were born during that time period already passed away. So I think this might be that we're just, this might be like a mortality selection issue. Um, this is measured blood pressure, which, you know, everything is going in the right direction, but it's just, you know, not really significant. Effect sizes are super big. And then I looked at a smaller sample of 372 people in our sample who actually had their blood pressure measured when they had their blood taken. So this was people, um, you know, they had their systolic and diastolic blood pressure measured. And then based on that, I calculated their mean arterial pressure. Um, which is a good kind of indicator of, of high blood pressure. Um, and they're super strong results in 372 people. So take for what it's worth, but um, the difference here be this is measured and this is self-reported. So there could also be some bias there from measurement error. And then we also do find some evidence of heart disease. And interestingly enough, when we looked at the people, you know, causes of death in the HRS, we didn't see anything yet with heart disease. So it could be that these individuals still haven't they're just kind of starting to show symptoms of heart disease. Then what we did was we put these different measures in the model. So here's our baseline model that shows, you know, this strong in utero effect we see with grim age, epigenetic age acceleration is the outcome. Um, when we add in, you know, SSD, Beck anxiety index, we wanted to see how the coefficients were changing. Um, here you can see big effect of current smoking right, which like, especially with Grimmage, Grimmage has smoking in it kind of as a measure. So that's not entirely surprising, um, but that really seems to, to mediate outcomes more than anything else. Um, and then uh, drinking, not so much, metabolic syndrome, a little bit there. We throw them all in the model together. We see a reduction in the coefficient of about 48%. So um, these kind of two pathways that at least in, the best that we could measure them um, might explain about 48%. So a lot that's still unexplained there. Um, 
oops, this was supposed to say, oh yeah, I was supposed to change this. This should be POAM. So this outcome is POAM and we see very similar pattern. Um, not as strong of a reduction, maybe about 27% in the coefficient. Um, not as strong of an effect of smoking. So that shows you kind of how these clocks are a little different. They're picking up on different phenomena slightly. Um, so finally, I just have like two more slides on, you know, we wanted to see like, to what extent is this relationship driven by selective behaviors versus kind of a causal effect of, of the shock? So there's two main potential sources of selection bias that we were worried about. One is endogenous sorting or kind of sorting on unobservables. So if there's something that we're not seeing, if, if we can see any sorting at all between the wage index and, and outcomes, um, individual outcomes, family level outcomes. And the other was um, fertility. And I'll, I'll explain that in, in a little bit more in a second. So we did just a basic sorting test here and, and we found, we didn't find a lot of evidence of sorting across observables. Obviously this is, you know, a small list. We couldn't look extensively and, and um, but from what we see here, there doesn't seem to be strong sorting um, in terms of the exposure on various outcomes like, you know, um, socioeconomic status of the family, um, et cetera. So it didn't seem like, you know, people are sorting into states based on their socioeconomic status or people are sorting into states based on their veteran status. Um, things like that. What's the first, so the first column on the female, that's a selection story. A little bit, yeah. So this is like, there's, there might be some selection on, I mean, it's only, it's not highly significant. Um, and we do control for sex in the model. Um, and then our mom's schooling. Mm -hmm. And same, yeah. So there might be some going there. Again, we control for that in the model. Um, but it's not, you know, we do expect that there's going to be maybe something going on, but nothing kind of super strong. Um, I don't know. I feel like those could as much be like just random chance. Father was absent. But so rural household means... Oh, sorry. So whether you grew up in a, a rural area. Self-report. Yeah, yeah. Whether you were like, uh, grew up in an urban or rural area. Huh. And when we, yeah, when we add like socioeconomic, like childhood socioeconomic status and stuff to the model, like where we showed the different, I mean, it doesn't really impact the coefficients a lot. I mean, the, the magnitudes, I mean, this is always true because this index thing, the scale of it's a little bit hard to figure out um, from the magnitudes, but the female one is consistent with females being robust in, in utero, right? Like good times that, being more, yes. is that right? Good times, yes. bad times you lose the male. Yes, that's a good point, yes. And the mother has no degree is about who's getting, who's having children during good times versus bad times, right? Yes, and we'll show, that's, yeah, thank you. That like cues in perfectly, perfectly to my, my next slide. So yes, that's, that's true. Um, so the other issue we're worried about is fertility. So. We know that business cycles can affect fertility through changes in income um, or the opportunity cost of time or information, et cetera. And really importantly, there were some large changes in fertility that started to happen around this time in the United States. So there was a huge overall decline in total fertility that began in the 1920s. And then fertility rates fell even more from 1929 to 1933. And then during the New Deal, they kind of slowly started to recover. Um, so here you can just see that this is the crude birth rate in the US uh, population. Um, this is the number of live births per uh, 1,000. And so why are we worried about this? Why is this like something that could kind of bias our results? Well, if patterns of fertility differed across groups of women, such that more highly educated women were more likely perhaps to have fewer children than their counterparts, um, this might result in a biased estimate of the shock on future outcomes. So perhaps in our sample, for example, we have more women who were born to lower educated mothers, which we know uh, are also then because of that, more likely to have uh, lower, not as good access to nutrition and other resources that might impact um, their long-term development and aging outcomes. So we wanted to see kind of how this was all working with our sample. So what we did here was um, we looked at the wage index and we interacted. Uh, so this is in the 1940 census. 
Um, so we looked at uh, for women's fertility in the 1940 census data. So here we have um, the wage index in utero to age six. Um, so we just kind of wanted to look in, in broad terms what's going on here. Um, so you do see that if, if someone is married, they were more likely to have a child. Um, if the mother has a lower high school, they were more likely to have a child, et cetera. Um, and so what does that mean? That in good times, you know, people who have lower SES are more likely to have children. So what, what this suggests is that women without a high school degree were actually less likely to have a child when the Great Depression hit. Um, so children born throughout the 1930s were actually more likely to be women born to highly educated women. Um, so much like mortality selection in our sample, we think that if anything, this indicates that changes in fertility due to the Great Depression, again, are more likely to bias our estimates downward because the children that were being born were being born um, to, to higher SES families. This is confusing why you have any of the age six as a lump instead of all the other regression. Yeah, yeah, I will say, um, so this was in our original paper and we're kind of in the process of going through edits. Um, so I think for this paper, we'll go back and just look explicitly in utero. Um, so yeah, this might change a little bit. Yeah, you're right. Just had to get around to it yet, but yeah, this is, um, yeah, because how that was a big criticism we actually got in our original paper was, that, you know, because I think you, you read that original, we had like in utero and then we had zero to age six kind of lumped together. And a lot of the reviewers were like, why zero to six? You know, you're making a lot of assumptions there. So that's why we've now moved to doing the full event time study, mm -hmm. showing the entire, just being like, okay, we're just gonna throw in the entire childhood. Yeah. And actually our results got stronger when we did that. So that was a really cool suggestion on part of a reviewer. And, um, and we saw when we did that too, that the in utero period stands out even more. Um, so overall, like the Great Depression, worst financial crisis in American history, um, obviously understand, understanding its effects on families and children is important on its own, um, but we feel it also provides a unique opportunity to exploit variation in early life exposures to labor market fluctuations to examine the long-term effects of business cycles on aging. Um, in particular in this rare epigenetic sample. Um, so we find that the Great Depression had negative effects on epigenetic age acceleration among individuals who survived until 2016. Um, these results connect fetal origins with aging, which are these two really critical stages of the life course. And it seems as though these epigenetic clocks are more sensitive measures that can perhaps detect biological aging in smaller samples. Um, so it's, it, it really seems from what we've looked at that it's much easier to detect um, you know, the effect sizes are bigger, et cetera, with these epigenetic clocks. Effects do not appear to be explained by selective responses. And we find mechanisms related to maternal stress and nutrition mediator explained about 26 to 48% of the overall effect that we see. So thank you. Some different grants we'd like to acknowledge. Um, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College Marshall Weinberg Endowment, we were both at the University of Michigan, <laughs> and then the NIA. So thank you. Zoomies, uh, uh, Lauren has given us a really provocative set of uh, results who might have questions, that, uh, especially on Zoom. I think Anna Marie is the only one maybe who's still on the... I see 13 participants. So. Oh. Let me see what the... Maybe if if you, yeah. They, oh. they are all just not uh, with their videos on. Oh, okay. Um, no, I, I have a question. Um, so what is the evidence that um, epigenetic clock actually responds to later in life environment? So if I read your paper and think that the only thing it predicts is in utero environment. What would be the counter argument? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good question. I think a lot of that is honestly still being worked out because so far all that I've seen, I haven't seen a lot of causal work that's been done. Um, I've seen a lot of associations, you know, between education and um, other factors, obviously, uh, you know, phenotypes like, um, dementia and these other things. So there's a lot that's correlated health-wise with these clocks. I've also seen correlations with these clocks and, and socioeconomic status, 
But in terms of somebody actually mapping out the life course and saying, okay, what is the most critical stage for epigenetic age acceleration? There, there just has, that hasn't been done yet, as far as I know. So, uh, so I wonder if that could be a bigger point you make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, earlier on, I alluded to the fact, like in my first slide, that that is like a big, there is no causal evidence. There is no evidence on critical stages um, with these clocks. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that that is a huge potential contribution. Um, and, you know, from what I've been seeing with some of the studies I've been doing with other students who aren't in the room right now is that you're not seeing a big effect in adulthood on certain, for the little natural experiments that we're looking at. Um, that doesn't mean that things in adulthood couldn't potentially affect your, you know, certainly, um, especially health conditions like cancer and high blood pressure and all these things can definitely affect how fast you're aging. Um, but yeah, the question, how kind of when did the, the foundations and the origins of that develop? Um, yeah, it's hard to, hard to know. But, but so you and Kristen made a point earlier saying, you know, epigenetics is something you can potentially change. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so then where did that argument come from? Because that's based on the assumption that if you change the epigenetic clock somehow, that will lead to, you know, improved health outcomes later in life. Yeah, right? exactly. So what, what is evidence for that? So there's evidence broadly just that, I mean, because the methylome regulates transcription, there's a lot of work being done in the cancer and cancer research right now. Mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of work that's being funded by the NIH that's trying to figure out mechanisms and, and actually potential targets. Um, so there are now some ph pharmaceutical drugs that are being developed that would help demethylate or methylate so, so that's certain areas. More about epigenetics in general, not about clocks, right? Well, the clocks, I think, are just one global. It's kind of like a clock is like a PGS, you know, it's like we have this global PGS measure and then we can from there start to dig into the SNPs and the genes that matter, you know, and I think for the clock, like it would be too global right now, I think, to say we're going to target everything and start. I think people are still figuring out what are the mechanisms, what are the genetic pathways. Um, but we now have a list of like, say, 2000 CPG sites that we can kind of focus in on that might be particularly important for aging. Um, and then we can look at those, um, the, the, you know, genes that those, um, those CPG sites control and, and start to maybe get an idea of that. So that's what I'm really excited to do if they ever release the CPG data. So I've been waiting for six years is, um, to actually start to get more functional at the CPG level. And that would be like really fun to work with you all on as well. Um, and or to construct other measures. So we could construct any sort of clock that you could think of. We could construct a socioeconomic status clock. We could construct a neighborhood clock um, and see like, what are we able to pick up if we use these machine learning methods? Um, because, you know, yeah, the epigenome is capturing kind of exposure to in the environment. Um, Lauren? Yes. Hi, it's Ava. Um, Hi. I was just, for my own sake, because I'm doing, um, a similar approach, like something similar in my dissertation. I'm curious about uh, the issue of fertility and its effects on um, essentially, I mean, it's a selection issue from what I understood. And um, you mentioned that the uh, fertility uh, differed across educational groups. So would um, adjusting for education like you already did uh, take care of that? Or what additional con concerns do we have in terms of fertility? I'm trying to think it through that and to really think about, you know, how big of an issue is fertility when we talk about, you know, who, who is selected um, for and to be in the study. I'm trying to wrap my head around it, maybe. It's more educational rather than a comment on what you did um, uh, in your analysis. Yeah, yeah, I know you always ask a lot of great questions, Ava, and I love how like thirsty you are to learn more and you always like ask these very provocative questions that get me to think deeper about things. So thank you. I think um, I think fertility is a huge issue because it, it's affecting who we're looking at. Um, it's kind of like, I love Jenna Noble's um, work and uh, you know, at her big talk before COVID hit, just there's so many people that we never even observe because they died right. before, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? And like before and, and so what does that mean? And, and how does that bias our estimates? And so, um, yeah, I think, I think it's a big issue in terms of thinking about um, the 
effects that we're observing and whether they're biased upwards or downwards based on the mothers and, and the people, the families that were actually having children during this time. I mean, but what I'm kind of curious, and maybe you don't have an answer, and I, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about this more. I do remember I went to Jenna's, um, and she's, she's commented about fertility before, so maybe I'll touch base with her too. Um, you know, it, just for everybody else's reference, uh, according to Jenna's estimates, about 70% of people uh, are like uh, of fetuses um, are not born. I don't know if that's if that's an accurate uh, reflection of um, uh, her work, but uh, she used uh, app data, like um, period tracking apps to estimate that. But I'm just wondering when we look at fertility, if it does vary by certain measures that we already account for in the analysis, is there anything additional that we should be worried about? Um, uh, that, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe that's too big of a question right now to think through. I think that's a really good question that, you know, this is something that I think is a big disciplinary difference. So, um, okay, you saw that more highly educated mothers were having children. Um, does that mean that if we control for mother's education, that takes away the problem? Maybe. Um, it takes away maybe some of the, the confounding there, but it, it's, it's just one measure, right? We can't see all aspects of people's lives um, that might have impacted. We can't control for everything that's related to a higher education maternal environment. And so while it helps to control for those things, um, it certainly doesn't completely take away the bias that, you know, higher educated mothers are more likely to have children. Okay. Um, that's, yeah, so that's, that's actually what an economist, like, I would love to hear Jason take on this too, what an economist would say versus like what an epidemiologist would say, or like, well, so from what you're saying, uh, the way that we might want to think about it is, okay, so we've adjusted our analysis, putting the fertility aside, we have adjusted our analysis for what we think are confounders, but here comes another thing that we, like, we need to find proxies for fertility. Uh, and include those in the analysis. So anything that might not be an actual confounder um, in our regular exposure to outcome relationship, but that may be a proxy to measure fertility, like educate, I mean, education is one, but it might not, this, these factors may not actually be related for our X and Y relationship, but they just may be proxies for fertility. And I don't know what those are. Would did that make any sense <laughs> of what I just said? Um, so I, I don't know if let's say smoking, um, if, if, I, I'm just going to make this up. Let's say smoking had nothing to do with your actual, um, the thing that you were studying, um, you know, in utero exposure to um, late life outcomes, but it did affect fertility. So then would we want to include smoking in our analysis because it's a measure, it's a proxy measure for fertility? I mean, I think it depends on whether you think it's a confounder or a mechanism. If it affects, if it affects who's born, who comes into our sample. I'm just trying to think through this and maybe it's like, yeah, um, maybe it's worth it's just writing like, something down on paper and working through it uh, slowly. But um, I'm just wondering what your initial thoughts were. I think if we had measures of prenatal smoking, that would be really interesting to look at and, and perhaps incorporate because that, but I, I would still see that as a mechanism that sure. you know, smoke, smoking is something that could have contributed to a person's epigenetic clock and you know, the foundational kind of forming of their, their epigenome and utero um, and so then that has a, a long-term effect. Or, I mean, let's not say but smoking. I, like, I, was was making, I was making smoking up. Uh, I was thinking that it didn't have any effect, but like what, I'm just wondering how we can account for fertility beyond, you know, how do you account for fertility beyond what you've already done in your regular analysis? You know, um, are there ways that we can account for it besides like including education, which is, you know, important in your regular analysis? How do we create a proxy measure for fertility? I don't know a proxy measure for fertility per se. Um, we did account for infant mortality rates in our sample or in our, in okay. our study. So that okay. was some that state level, you know, differences in infant mortality. Um, so that was something we, we did do. 
I don't know. Yeah, Jason, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you think about these things a lot. I do, but with no question, with no answer. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I just reframe it to see if it's helpful for you, Ava, is that um, another, I think another way of saying what this issue is, is that there's non-random attrition from the full sample that the treatment can affect. So you would worry about that, right? The treatment is affecting who's in your long-term sample, which you could think of as attrition from the, you know, okay. from the population. And so there you have some at least tools to think about what you might do in this case where you have the full population, the treatment affects who you can actually see longer term, which is attrition. Mm -hmm. You might think about correctives to that attrition. Does that make, is that, that's another way to- That, like, that makes a little more sense, over. yeah. Yeah, pull that over. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, it just gives you a sense of some attack strategies you might have. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. I was that reminded me of the lead bounds. So there are some the like a it's called lead bounds. So this is one um, economist who who has this strategy for mortality selection because especially if you think mortality selection is biasing your coefficient upward, you really want to show that it's not driving your full result. So there you could construct. Um, you could basically look at people who uh, died early and try to kind of construct an actual like impute a clock for them or something and look at people who died later. And then what you can do is kind of construct like a, a more bounded estimate of, okay, if we actually were to include people who died earlier, if we were to include people who died later, like how does this affect kind of the, the bound of our coefficient? Um, so there are some like really interesting ways that people go about that. And, and especially if you think that it's biasing, it kind of determines on what you think the direction of the bias is, how important that is. Is it like in this sense, everything was biasing our coefficient down, meaning we were showing results that were the lower bound of the true estimate. If we thought we were showing inflated results because all the bias was pushing our coefficient up, then it might be more important to actually do some of that bounded analysis. There's a paper that comes to mind. I can't remember the author, but he was looking at polio and how that affected um, people's labor market outcomes the polio epidemic and he found that people who were affected by polio and actually put into wheelchairs actually had better labor market outcomes so because this went in the opposite direction of what you would expect he really he used these rebounds to show um that no this was actually kind of really what was happening it wasn't all selection so yeah you have to think carefully about it and 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 mull over these things Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone.